Good morning, everyone. This is Jason Gisband from Flexboard. I'm glad to uh, welcome everybody to our second day of our two-day uh, session. Today, we'll be talking about customs and agency exams. I have uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and also, first, thank you for, for us being a little bit late. I appreciate the wait. Uh, but just FYI on myself, I've been a customs broker uh, for the last 24 years, been in the industry for the last few decades. So spent a lot of time in the customs brokerage business and really got in-depth knowledge of, of these sort of issues. So I want to share that. I have here today with me my colleague Brenda, and I'll let Brenda introduce herself. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. I am the Vice President of Custom Compliance here at Flexport, and I'm really glad that we can share the little bit that we have learned over our decades of experience in the business. Um, this is a two-part series that we are going through. Um, and of course, before we even get started, I need to uh, run over a legal dis disclaimer. I'm not going to read this whole slide. I just want to tell you that obviously this is not to be considered as legal advice, just general information. If you're in a situation where you really need some help, we suggest you contact a trade attorney. Great. So yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this was a two-part series we did. So hopefully all of you were able to join us on Tuesday. Uh, we did a discussion on customs holds and exams. Uh, which included manifest holds, entry holds, and partner government agencies. And that uh, was a great uh, presentation, I think. Hopefully you all thought so. Um, and uh, anyways, we're hoping everybody that was on Tuesday was here today. And uh, so now we'll move into the second part of our series here, uh, physical examination of cargo. So first to talk about the examination process with customs and agencies. It, 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 it can be different, um, but basically what ends up happening is there's an unresolved hold or review, um, which we were, were speaking about on Tuesday, and that can turn into an examination. Um, there's different ways that that can happen. Firstly is uh, the manifest hold. So when cargo is put on a manifest hold, um, it can actually go directly to an exam. They, you know, a lot of times you'll see a review first, and we talked about that on, on Tuesday, but uh, they can actually designate it for exam right away. Um, basically, that would happen, uh, you know, if, if they already have information or if they do an X-ray and they see something that they want to look at more closely, they'll do a physical exam and they'll actually have the cargo moved. Uh, or sometimes with a with an ag exam, CBP Agriculture. Uh, they'll do a tailgate and find something that they want to look at more closely or pull the, the cargo out, so they'll move that for an exam as well. Um, and then, of course, when the broker files a customs entry, um, that can immediately be, be designated for examination as well. Most of the time, they'll see a review first, but uh, the customs, again, can just immediately put an exam hold on, and then we know to move the cargo or take the next steps for that examination. Uh, and then just to mention, customs really is the first line of defense. So some of the government agents still do regulate imports, but through customs. So customs will put the goods on hold. They now have uh, agent, uh, agents that work for them that are agricultural specialists. And those are people that came over from APHIS. That's the USDA side of things that actually looks at imported cargo. Um, so they're the specialists and they, they work with customs to do these exams. Also CPSC, that's the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, they will do their exams through customs as well, um, which is a little different than some of the other agencies such as Fish, uh, Fish and Wildlife Services or FDA. They have their own independent system still. Uh, FDA does work within ACE, but um, once you start communicating with the F uh, FDA on an exam or a review hold, um, it's done through a separate system. Same thing with examinations. When we notify the FDA of where that cargo will be located, that's done through a separate system uh, from customs. Fish and Wildlife, again, they have a completely separate system. That's EDEX. And as I was talking about that on Tuesday, that uh, that's a completely separate system. We'll talk more about what those are and, uh, and how those processes work as we move ahead here. So to be familiar um, when your cargo goes on exam, it certainly helps you to understand um, what type of exam you're flagged for. Um, with customs, there are a number of teams and they have specialty members of that team that have training 
for the uh, exact uh, items that they're researching. The anti-terrorism contraband enforcement team, the merchandise uh, enforcement team, and the international I always get this wrong. <laughs> I bet. We talk about that. Uh, we, we, you can outline it when we get to it. Okay. <laughs> um, too many acronyms in this business. And sometimes you stare at one and go, I have no idea what that is. A tailgate exam. So obviously this is uh, done on ocean shipments and the container is actually looked at at the port terminal. It's done by customs ag specialists. Um, as we talked on Tuesday, they look for plant pests or uh, insects, um, things that you know unknowingly can crawl into your shipment. They generally uh, don't take any product, but it's done right there at the terminal. An intensive exam is really uh, physically looking at a small part or a large part of that entire shipment. Um, for an ocean shipment, it means the whole thing um, again, whatever customs designates or the agency designates needs to be taken out of the container um, and they will pick and choose which cartons they open and really thoroughly examine. The cargo has to be moved to a customs exam site. Um, and if you are just getting an FDA exam or you've completed a customs exam and still have an FDA exam uh, that you haven't passed yet, you may be able to move your cargo to an importer warehouse within the port limits. Great. So talk a little bit about those exam teams that, that uh, Brenda mentioned and um, get into the detail of them. You know, we, we, we always refer to things by the acronyms now as brokers. So sometimes I, you know, forget myself, but uh, AT set that, that is anti-terrorism contraband enforcement team. And they're looking specifically for illegal products, contraband. So they're somewhat of a more secretively, a secretive agent, uh, agents, part of the agency, excuse me. Um, we'll talk about that. But um, then there's the merchandise enforcement team. That's the MET team we refer to them as. And this team, they're looking for trade related issues such as uh, is the HTS number and duty rate that we've applied to the entry correct? Um, is the country of origin marking on the goods? Um, that's really what they're looking for a lot of times uh, because those boxes that they're being shipped in have to be marked. Um, and so that they're looking for those types of things. And then the integrated border enforcement team. And this is fairly new when it comes to customs. Um, it's only been around since the Department of Homeland Security. Um, but this is a team that encompasses 15 regions along the northern border. And they're basically a multifaceted law enforcement initiative comprised both of Canadian American partners and they focus on issues that happen at the border. So if you're bringing in goods crossing the borders, uh, then you're probably going to run into the IBET team. Uh, we see more of that, um, but, you know, again, it's a new thing, but the, the, they have their mission uh, a little bit separate from some of these other teams. So. Tailgate exams. So tailgate exams, they're typically done on ocean containers. Of course, uh, that's the, the Department of Agriculture, or not the Department of Agriculture, but CBP Agriculture specialists. Um, they're those specialists that came from USDA, and now they work for customs. Uh, they're going to look at the container, and they'll do that at the first port of unlading. So if your cargo is moving inland, uh, and, and, you know, in, under bond or, you know, to an inland port, um, Ag is always going to put a hold on it at the first port because they don't, of course, want the cargo moving inland. If it gets there and there's a problem, then it's farther in the, the commerce. Um, so they'll break the seal on the container. They actually are at the terminal with customs uh, border uh, protection agents that are doing the uh, x-rays. They're out there. Uh, they'll break the container. They open it up. They'll look inside. They might jump up and look in. They're not taking anything out, um, but they're looking to see if they can see any pests. Uh, and or solid wood packaging material. So if you're using wood pallets, uh, this is basically what they're looking for. And so the, again, those solid wood packet pallets should be marked correctly uh, with the regulatory regulations uh, under the USDA. And if it's not, they're going to they're going to take it for a physical exam. Um, so if pests are untreated, solid wood are found in the container. As I said, cargo must uh, often be exported. You know, a lot of the ports now don't even have fumigation facilities. So if they want, they say you can fumigate, but there's no one to fumigate, 
they will only let you export it. They won't let you destroy it because that means you have to bring it into the commerce to get it to a destruction facility. Um, some ports will have fumigation, you know, at their port and they will allow it. Uh, other times, some ports that don't have it, they'll let you take the cargo off the pallets, but you got to re-export the pallets. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that go on with that, you know, with manipulating cargo like that. Uh, so it's it's a big big pain. But just be sure if you're shipping solid wood, you know you know what you're doing. Uh, yeah. So an intensive exam, uh, yes. If your cargo is designated for intensive exam, uh, it generally needs to be moved to a customs exam station. Specialty locations bonded by customs um, with customs inspectors on site. Um, and their primary reason for having these warehouses is to do uh, intensive exams. So the exam can be designated either from the manifest or from the entry. Um, if it's done at the manifest and you have less than container load cargo, um, you may actually have multiple exams. Um, it's unfortunate when that happens, but again, they're looking um, at a manifest they can designate for exam or at an entry and designate for exam. In the system that the broker uses, they will just get a message that says examination. Um, and from that, the broker then needs to work with a customs exam station and make arrangements to move the cargo to their choice of customs exam station and have it devanned. Customs will tell uh, the warehouse, the CES, how much of that container needs to come out of the container, either a partial or a full divan. Obviously, the more that they withdraw from the container, the longer it takes and the more money that's involved. Cargo that is under the anti-terrorism contraband enforcement team, um, AT set will be moved directly by customs. The broker is not involved. Um, sometimes we don't, um, we realize the cargo is no longer at the ocean terminal and it's been moved um, and then we put two and two together. It's not really shared with us that um, AT set is doing an exam. Yeah, I think, and just to mention on that, if you think about what they're doing, you know, what they're looking for, they don't want and they don't want the bad guys to find out that they're looking for contraband if they believe there's contraband. So they really uh, that's what we're when we talk about a black curtain. That's where you know it helps to have a broker that that can get that information and really push to get it um, without you know pushing too hard. But. Right. Once uh, the exam is complete, once once customs is satisfied that they have looked for uh, whatever they've looked for, they'll make their notes within their system. Um, they're finished and there will be an ABI message. If you're uh, again in a less than container load shipment in a container that was designated at the manifest level, then all the individual importer shipment in that container are put back into the container. The container is then moved to the deconsolidation warehouse for segregation of those shipments for the individual importers. So it really is uh, you know, devan the container, get a manifest level exam, repack the container, move the container to the deconsolidator location, devan the container, break down the individual less than container load shipments. So, <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of uh, movement of the cargo and obviously time and the expense for that is borne in that circumstance by actually all the clients uh, who have cargo in the manifest level LCL exam. Yeah, I think too, you know, um, it, it helps when you work with a company that, that can, it has data because, you know, here's a plug for Flexport, you know, knowing um, things that have happened over time and be able to utilize that within the, in the loading of containers that can help, uh, you know, with that kind of thing. But without going into detail further, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so we're running into Food and Drug Administration. They they have another different different process, as we said. Um, the cargo can be moved to a non-bonded facility once Customs has released the goods, but it has to remain intact until FDA releases it. This is an important point. Um, but just to move ahead here, and I'll come back to that. The FDA they they require the broker or entry filer to upload the location information where that freight is. So if it was moved, you know where it was moved to 
or if it stayed, where where is it? Uh, when's it available? Who can they contact there? That all has to be sent to the FDA, and that's done through their system. That's called the ITAC system. As I mentioned on Tuesday, once the FDA uh, gets to this point, they communicate through ITAC. So the broker or filer has to do that, and they put they upload that information there. Um, the FDA officer who gets that information through ITAX will then reach out to that warehouse location uh, and they'll arrange an exam. It usually takes within about five days. Um, usually we see it sooner, but you know, again, it depends on the port. And some ports, like our port here, in, in we're sitting in San Francisco, Oakland, they have a lot of different offices that are up and down because the region's big. Um, whereas you might go to other ports that's smaller and you can't take the cargo too far out if you're going to take it out of the, you know, the location where it's at. So keep that in mind, but it's usually less than five days. Um, the cargo has to be held intact. This is huge. Um, you know, it, it, the officer will come to examine the goods and, and they won't release the goods if they don't find all the cargo there. They won't even look at them uh, if, if the cargo is not intact. So it must remain intact. They'll release the cargo electronically once they've done the inspection. Um, so the, the broker will be notified of that, of the filer. So you know, make sure that you guys understand if cargo is released um, by the inspector saying, oh, it's okay, you can take it. We, re we highly recommend you wait until you see the cargo electronic release uh, because you never know. It's just always better to wait for that. Uh, it's completely up to the importer, but it's important. Uh, policy to follow. Um, any cargo that is not held intact prior to re the release of the goods, may, and this is why this is important, may be subject to a penalty of three times the entered value of that merchandise. So it's a, it's a negative record on that importer's history. The FDA will keep that in their records, and you know obviously it's, it's a bad thing. So we really important the, that importers understand if you're going to move or have your broker move that cargo. Make sure wherever you're moving it to, they fully understand the requirements so that you don't have somebody make a mistake and it costs you, uh, you know, on that. So very important. Fish and wildlife uh, exams. So they're different. Again, um, as, as we said, the declaration and release is required prior to the customs entry, entry submission. So before anything can be done with customs, Fish and Wildlife has to give the release. That's all done through their system, and that is completely separate from ACE altogether. There's no connection, so the broker filer has to communicate and file everything through EDEX. That's all done through the internet, obviously, and you can create an account. Importers can have their own accounts, um, but the importers also must obtain an import-export license uh, if they're going to import commercially, and that has an annual review. Again, that can be done through EDEX, and your broker uh, should be able to help you uh, find all that. Um, and then if you're going to import into a port where there's no Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, or you're bringing in a commodity that uh, is regulated by the Fish and Wildlife that requires a permit, you can do all that through EDEX as well. Um, and then Fish and Wildlife will, I, I put always physically examine cargo on their own, and they don't require the broker to be there. That There is some exceptions to that that I've seen. Um, and it might be different in different ports and diff different relationships that brokers have with these agencies. But um, we've seen scenarios where, you know, the cargo is coming from the same shipper. It's the same consignee. It's the same exact cargo all the time. You know, it's it's a wearing apparel importer bringing in shirts and they have shells on them. And so th there's a, you know, there's something that, that that's known. And so sometimes they won't look at it. They'll just say, oh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, you know, send me the documents. Maybe they want to look at the physical documents and then they might release it in edex without the actual inspection but you can expect generally that they will do an exam um, and then they charge user fees to do that on every shipment any, any commercial shipment there is a user fee uh, we'll talk about what those fees are at the end here um, but again that's paid through edex um, and then just to give you some examples of products containing fish and wildlife regulated material and it's commonly misdeclared like i just said shirts with with buttons made out of shells a lot of times that that doesn't get declared, I think, um, or you know they're not the, the broker doesn't have enough information, and they might not be declaring it properly. So make sure your broker understands all of your products uh, and what's on them. Um, leather apparel is another one. Specialized leathers, you know, it might say leather shoes, and they're alligator. Well, that's that's regulated by the Fish and Wildlife or ostrich. 
so those types of things are definitely something to look out for. And a, a good broker will ask you if they haven't uh, cleared your shipments in the past. They'll make sure they understand what type of leather they're dealing with, or or you know what's going on there. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is another government agency that regulates imports into the United States. Um, they do not have their own system. They partner with customs to get uh, their commodities processed at time of import. The ABI message will only show exam, not a specific CPSC exam. And the CPS inspectors, again, work with customs. Once that cargo is moved to the central or customs exam station, they will look at it and decide to release it. They will look at it and decide they need to sample and issue a conditional release. If that happens, you may be allowed to move your cargo to your premises if you seek out specific CPSC permission. This is not a given, you need to ask for it, and it's on a case-by-case -case basis if they allow it. Um, they may also sample and decide to detain. If that happens, they will send the goods to a CPSC approved laboratory. Their own internal guidelines say that they try and get lab results to the client within 30 days. Um, in our, in our uh, overview of this, they're pretty good with that, but as all government agencies and customs, it does depend on workloads. They will issue a notice of sampling and detention, and they will share in that notice the information on the process, and they will also on that notice request certain certificates that the importer is to have on hand. Um, such as third-party testing results or actual children's product certificates. Some of the commodities that typically go under exam by CPSC are things like mattresses, uh, children's pajamas, children's uh, sweatshirts, you're not allowed to have the drawstrings. Um, furniture has uh, some furniture, uh, bedroom dressers that are high, have tip over problems. So really the CPSC's mission is to protect the residents from the US. So they have kind of a broad area of commodities that they cover. So what are some possible causes for undergoing a customs or agency examination? Um, and certainly we are not privy to this. This is totally up to customs and the agencies to decide. But based on you know, a history as a broker, you do get a sense for what things tend to cause merchandise to be under scrutiny. First is being a new importer of record. Um, typically, first shipments from new clients undergo uh, either a dock review or uh, more commonly even an intensive exam. Same with a foreign importer of record. If you have a shipper, you may not know that shipper has a history of problems, but customs database knows this, and that may be causing a flag for an examination. Um, same with the country of export or routing of cargo through a certain country. Different countries have different uh, threats or concerns to customs or agencies, so they will be looking at certain countries of exports more commonly than others. Um, commodities, this is a big category, and again, um, think of the different agencies. There are certain commodities under each of those agencies that almost always go for exam. Um, if the commodity is also one that is typically counterfeited, they may be looking at it specifically for those reasons. Um, there's a program as an importer that you can join, another acronym, CTPAT, Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. And if you take the time as an importer and join this program, you actually get a benefit of having less exams. That's one of the call outs to the CTPAT program. Um, and lastly, this last indicator is really just showing customs that you are a legitimate repeat importer and you expect uh, that you will be importing more frequently, and that is that you have a continuous or annual bond versus a single entry bond per shipment. 
Yeah, and just to add to the CT pad thing, because I like to give plugs for customs. Um, they're basically they give importers a lot of, like Brenda said, a lot of uh, things. And just to mention one, you get if you got an exam in your CT pad, you get in front of the line. So that's a big deal, I think. Definitely. So you do want to know what's it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Uh, first and foremost, know that all of these charges are for the account of the importer. It actually says that in the regulations. So yeah, if you're flagged for exam, it's your uh, bank account that's going to pay for this. Uh, these timelines that are all generalities, these dollar amounts we give here are really all generalities. They all depend on the specific port you're in, um, how congested the port is, etc. But again, as a general average, an intensive exam typically takes three to five working days. Um, and in some unfortunate situations, we have seen when the ports are backlogged, it can take up to three weeks to commence with an intensive exam. Uh, the costs that are associated with it, obviously when you have to move cargo to a customs exam station, that is by a bonded trucker. Um, and those rates are dependent upon the port, how many truckers there are, how congested they are. So again, some generalities are the busier ports have higher cost and longer times, and the ports with less volumes are typically less expensive and have shorter times. Just as, again, a general understanding, um, and certainly um, these costs that we're putting on the screen here can vary greatly, but as an average, we say if your container needs a full D-Van, it'll be $1,000 to $1,500. Um, note also FDA has separate charges. If it's FDA uh, visits your warehouse um, and they only need one visit, there's no charge. But if something happened and that officer had to return to the warehouse uh, for a second exam, uh, maybe you were closed for lunch, maybe the warehouse was super busy and they couldn't accommodate the FDA, inspect FDA inspector at that time, they will bill you an hourly rate for having to return a second time. Fish and Wildlife also is an agency that charges for their exam. It starts at a $55 minimum. Typically, your broker will pay all of these agency charges on your behalf and bill you for them, so you don't have to worry about paying it before you pick, up, pick it up, but you would have to work out those details with your customs broker. Yep, and then just, um to comment about, about again on exams, because Brenda had went through that kind of scenario that she was talking about, of how you have an LCL shipment and what actually happens. So if you bring in cargo and it's not a full container um, and on the ocean side and you're dealing with another agency, you might see a longer time if you're dealing with exams on uh, all those different agencies and on the LCL cargo, so. <laughs> Cool, so how do we avoid the black curtain, uh, as we say? Um, well, what are some best practices? Um, you should have, as importers, you should have full visibility of the status of their shipments. Um, you know, uh, our company definitely, that's what we, we are all about. Um, you know, our, our clients, that's what they see on their dashboard. They see the status, they see all of the messaging. Um, if you're, you know, working with another broker, you should ask your broker for a copy of the system messaging with customs to ensure you're seeing everything. Um, you know, sometimes brokers will say, well, we, we're not totally sure. Well, they, they should be able to give you something uh, and, and show you what they see. Uh, and if you really aren't getting what you need, I, I'd say ask for daily and weekly reports. Um, you know, so there's some specific metrics or milestones that you want to see, um, you know, looking at those exams, what's the frequency, who's the shipper, you know, trying to look at some metrics there and, and figure out what's going on and maybe there's something you can do about it. Um, ensure your supplier, they're creating, you know, complete and compliant commercial invoices and, you know, move information, uh, more, excuse me, more information uh, is typically better. Oh, sorry, I just caught a, a typo. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely more information on the commercial invoice is better. Uh, avoid using solid wood packing, as we said. You know that's a, that's definitely something they're going to look at. Um, if you are, so if you're not, make sure you, you're notating that in your commercial documents. You know the bill of lading should say does not contain solid wood packing. That'll get in the manifest, and they'll see that, and that helps. 
Uh, make sure your shipper, uh, if they are using solid wood, that they're properly treating it. Don't, you know, uh, allow them to send pallets that aren't treated correctly because that's going to be a big problem. And you won't find out until you, uh, you know, get a get a, a exam. So it's good to get pictures too of things uh, from your shippers. Uh, become a member of CT Pad. I can't stress how how much that will get you a benefit as an importer. Um, you know, it's not easy necessarily. It costs some money. Um, but you will get some some benefits there. And then another important thing, FDA cargo. It's going it needs to be held intact until the FDA releases it. So if you have a customs release, make sure you have that FDA release before you do anything with that cargo. And set up some procedure with your broker so that you get that information. These are some uh, resources we thought that you might want to uh, go see. What these uh, customs or other agencies offer you as far as additional information certainly you can click on them if you want and I think lastly we just wanted to open it up for Q&A um, I think in the go to webinar there's a box where it says please type your question we're happy to uh, get through some of those in a few minutes here I think we've been rambling on a little longer than we thought but <laughs> let's see what we have here let's see Okay, those two. Oh, wait, go ahead and put some in. Oh, here's one. Here's one. You want to take this? Sure. Or me to do sure, it? I can do it. What can we do about having too many exams and nothing is found wrong? Wow. Well, it, you know, initially, unfortunately, not a lot until you have some data. So once you have shipments come in and you start to see a trend, um, it, 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 Customs does have a, somewhat of an unwritten rule where you can write a letter once you've had five consecutive shipments, consecutive meaning same product, come into the same port, was examined and released without a problem, um, and, and, and that once you've had that happen, you can write a letter to them and, and ask for more details on what's going on. Uh, over and above that, Work, try to work with a broker that has good, obviously some good connections with the agencies so they, they made you know good relationships so they can try and get as much detail as possible but um, that's about really uh, all you all you can do uh, over and above yeah go ahead see. oh here's one um, why does it seem that on ocean shipments my cargo needs to move to an exam station but on air they seem to do it at the terminal that's a very good question. Um, and this is also one of those port specific questions. Um, many, many decades ago, they had inspectors at all the locations. Um, and as uh, all businesses decided to look at cost, they found it was uh, better for customs to really pinpoint where exams were done. Airline terminals tend to be very close together, and inspectors can actually, you know, drive in their car from terminal to terminal um, very quickly. So they allow air cargo to remain at the airline terminal, and the inspector moves. For ocean cargo, they typically move it to a container exam station because the terminals don't necessarily have the facilities to demand. Uh, ocean containers and let cargo sit there waiting for customs to examine it. So they, they needed the specialty warehouses for that. So good question, um, and it is different. Um, there are some ports, I, I think they're the inland ports really, um, where they may have roving inspectors even for ocean, but I think those are far and few between anymore. Yeah, smaller ports usually. So here's another question. Is the cost of intensive exam limited to 1,000 to 1,500? Um, are other fees added on? So the 1,000 to 1,500 is what we, we see, and that in pretty much is inclusive of what would be needed for the exam. So that is any fees to move the cargo. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze in a minute, but um, <laughs> everybody backed up. <laughs> uh, went away. Okay. Um, yeah. So any other any other fees that or, or any fees related to the exam, that, and as I said, the movement of the cargo, and then anything at the physical warehouse. So if you know they have to pull out the full container, that all the labor charge, all that's included. That over and above that, you know, the, there might be other fees that you have to pay to the air uh, the airline. Well, not the airline if it's an airline, but for the ocean container, if the container stayed at the terminal too long, and there was some fees that accrued there for storage. 
because you were waiting to move the container, something like that. Other than that, uh, all of the, but, what we said should be included. And, and those charges, as we said, are just estimates um, and generalizations. So your charges could be very different depending on the exact scenario that you're facing. Yeah, yeah. So I was asking if they're going to get the presentation. Uh, yes, definitely. It will come to every participant. Thank you for asking. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Mm, I don't know what the percentage is. Somebody's asking what percentage of containers coming into the U.S. falls under the FDA. That's a tough one. I have no idea. Yeah, that's a really <laughs> tough one. Um, we could probably look that up, though, and see if we can get you an answer. Um, here's a good one. Does having a floor-loaded container versus a skid-loaded container change how long it takes to get through customs? Most certainly it can. You know oh, yeah. Saying? So, uh, I mean, really, you have to think about the logistics of taking that cargo out. If it's designated for a full intensive uh, examination, that means people are taking box by box out of that container versus using a forklift and putting the pallets on the uh, warehouse floor for customs to point to cartons and say which one needs exam. I mean, the other problem you have with floor loaded cargo is when they go to put it back into the container, there often are a couple of cartons that don't fit back in because they didn't have the same uh, skills at Tetris to uh, pack up the container. So um, really, when that happens, they actually give the cartons to the driver and say, you know, these are the few extras that didn't fit back in. So yeah. yes, having a floor loaded container will cost more for the intensive exam. One thing to mention, I think, is that um, if it's on a pallet, then uh, obviously the labor, right? Right, so. right. So, all right, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, this uh, material will be available on flexport.com, and uh, we will also announce some future webinars. So if you have any suggestions for that, we're happy to hear them. Thank you again. Thanks for joining.